And amen. Jesus is saying in verse number 23, if you'll look, the hour is come. Now is the time. It's here. It has arrived. Yesterday, I had the privilege to be a part of a wonderful Christian wedding. We were in that room in my office with Charles and some of the wedding party. Caleb was in there, and, and we talked for a few minutes, and one of the things I said to Charles right before I came out and the service started, I said, now is the time. The next time you do, fill in the blank, whatever it is, you're going to be a married man. And ladies and gentlemen, everybody look here. Every eyeball on me. God help all of us. Now's the time for you. Stop it. Stop playing church. Stop being this cultural Christian that we just do all these things because that's the way we were raised or, you know, we put on an act. We're all hypocrites, by the way. Now's the time. Make a change. All of us. We find that Jesus had some very strong words to say. But before we get into this, let me just give you a brief, brief background of who Christ is as we lead into this particular message. By the way, verses 23 to 26 answers the question, Sirs, we should see Jesus. And then he goes on and says, Before that happens, let me tell you who I am. A couple of things we learn about Christ as we study the Scriptures. Number one, He was sinless. A great verse you might want to write down that defines, and there are many, that Christ never sinned. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, For He had made Him to be sin for us, now say this, who knew no what? Sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. The God-man who rose from the dead was sinless. The only person ever to walk the planet, ever to be born in the history of the world was Jesus Christ. He's the God-man. He was sinless. By the way, if He wasn't sinless, He wasn't a perfect sacrifice, and He could not save you from His sins. He had to be sinless. We find in 1 Peter chapter 2, it says uh, regarding Christ, who, knew, who did no sin, sin, neither was guile found in His mouth. He was a sinless Savior. He was also God. We find in John chapter 10, Jesus Christ talks about that. He was all God, but yet He was all man. He was sinless. He said, I and my Father are one. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, God Himself hung there as a sacrifice. Listen to this. For me and for you. You know, a lot of people don't believe that. They throw out little things. He was a good man. He was a prophet. You know, all dogs go to heaven. And, you know, we, we, like, to, we like to water down basic Bible truths. The Jews answered Jesus in John chapter 10 saying, For a good work we would stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And they're answering what Christ has said, Because thou being a man... Makest thyself God. Did you know Jesus very clearly said he was God? And by the way, that's what got him all aggravated. You can heal, clothe, and feed people all you want. But call yourself God and we'll crucify you. The two principles I just went over, a lot of people really have not comprehended. He was sinless. And he was God. Christ died for our sins. You know that. You live in America. You hear that. You hear that all over. The, most of you have heard your whole life. But do you really understand what that means? See, the Bible clearly says there had to be death. Romans 5, 8 says, But God commanded his love toward us while I, Fred Ayers, was a sinner. Christ died for us. 
That's incredible. God died for us, for me, for you. First Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but then it says quickened or made alive by the Spirit. Interesting, isn't it? So what did the resurrection prove? We'll get to the text in a moment. This is all just building up to who Jesus Christ was and what he did. The resurrection proved Jesus' claims. It proved his claims. We find in Matthew chapter 28, verse number 6, it says, He is not here, for he has risen, as he said, Come see the place where the Lord lay. It validated. A lot of people, including those in mainline cultural Christianity, if you want to call that, they believe that Jesus was a good man. They believe that he healed. They believe he had miracles. But they're not really sure he actually rose from the dead. That's just kind of the, a storyline. I have very good friends of mine that I worked with in the secular world that are Muslims. Good people. Good people, but just like anybody else, without Jesus Christ, without accepting him by faith, they're doomed to an eternity in hell. And they say to me, they say, Fred Ayers, let me tell you something. We believe Jesus Christ existed the Quran talks about that. We believe he was a good man. We believe he was a prophet. And I say to them, I said, if he was a prophet, he was a colossal liar because everything he said was a lie. He was much more than a prophet. He was God. So let's go back to our text as we lay that foundation this morning. Is the resurrection personal to you? Is it? Think about it. Think about the, the whole storyline. This is a day it's really about you. It's not cultural, religious day in which we celebrate some 2,000-year-old story about a man named Jesus, his coming out of the tomb, and everybody gets worked up about it. No, ladies and gentlemen, look here. It is about April 1st, 2018, and I have in my notes, this is incredible how God works. I put 1115, it's exactly 1115 right now. God is good. <laughs> it's about what you are, what you're going to say, and what this day means about your life. Let me give you an example. Make it real and personal. It's like this. In 1996, my big toe was incredibly in pain. It hurt so bad. I couldn't lay down and put a sheet on my feet. It was like somebody getting a hammer and going, bang, bang. I had gout. I never had gout before. And I had gout, and it was so bad, I was in such incredible pain, you couldn't even wear shoes, you couldn't walk, and heaven forbid you stubbed your toe, you miles will go ahead and cut off your right arm. Honestly, it was that painful. I went to the doctor, and I got it taken care of, blah, 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 blah. Here's the point. Up till 1996, when I realized I had gout, I had read Spurgeon, the great prince of preachers that many of you have read about, he had gout, struggled with that. I had known people who had gout. But if I look here, in 1996, I knew what it was, and I knew what it felt like to have gout. And ladies and gentlemen, that application may not be what I want it to be, but how many of you, you know of Christ, You've heard of Christ. You've talked about Christ. You may have heard me preach a number of times, but you've never experienced who Jesus Christ is. Think about it. 
Verse number 23 says, And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Should be glorified. This text is explaining that a time has come for Jesus Christ to go to the cross, to die and to rise again, and he will be glorified and sit at the right hand of the Father Almighty. The healing, the feeding, the preaching had come to an end. Now is the time. Now is the time that he is going to die. And he's saying to the Greeks, Sir, you should see Jesus. He's saying to his disciples, that I have to die. The time has come. And of course, he would rise again. This is a story that some people just don't get it. Jonathan Edwards said the following. Your mind can know honey. It's sweet. People can tell you it's sweet. You've read in books about it, etc. But if you haven't actually tasted it, you know with your, your head, but not with your heart. When you actually taste it, you experience it for yourself. You know it in a full way, and you can know it in your heart. And I want to tell you, that's how the Lord changes people. Raymond Abul Mikhail was here last Sunday night, our missionary to Lebanon. And he says, over in Lebanon, he says, you're either a Jew, a Christian, or a Muslim. You're either one of those three. There's no in-between. And he says, the bad thing about Christians, and he actually believed that, I, I believe it's here, is people claim they're Christians, but they've never experienced Christianity through the saving grace of Jesus Christ. That's just who they are. God is prompting you to go from a superficial knowledge of Him to a personal relationship. Now is the time. Turn to Luke chapter 16, please. Let's go there. I will not have that on the screen. Please, Luke chapter 16. If you have, don't have a Bible, there's one in front of you. I'd like to show you something that will help you as it helps me. Luke chapter 16. Look at verse number 19, please. Luke 16, 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and feared subtuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which, laid, which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Now we can see the difference between these two, economically and the way they were treated. And it came to pass, the beggar, what happened? Say it. Died. And was carried, into the angel, carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also, what? By the way, we're all going to die, right? And was buried. I got in my Bible a little note when I did my devotion. The laughter stopped. The laughter stopped. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Mm. Just think about that for a minute. And Abraham said, remember, circle that word, please. Tom Farrell circled the message. I was at the wilds. He circled that word, remember. That thou... In thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither they can pass to us that would come from thence. Hey. 
I'm a simple person in this area. When the time has come for you to go, it's too late to change your mind. And all the Easter services for me and for you are going to burn in the back of your memory. We don't pray people out of purgatory. We don't pray people from one part of some compartment to another that's not in the Bible. Now's the time. Now's the time. Acts 17.30 says this. I have it on the screen. In the times of this ignorance, God winked at. Okay, it's over, bud. For me and for you. I'm not trying to scare anybody into receiving Christ. I'm not trying to scare anybody into heaven because God doesn't work that way. What I'm saying, if you're a Christian, this ought to really convict you about where you are in the casualness of my life and your life. But now cometh all men everywhere to repent. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says this. For he have said, I've heard thee in a time accepted. In the day of salvation, I have succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Before I go to my next point, I believe we have a sin problem. The sin problem was settled at Calvary. Glorification took place by rising from the dead. And I personally think as a pastor for 19 years, we spent far too much time on trying to get the finer points of doctrinal differences taken out of care of, but yet we never really were concerned with why Jesus rose again and our people saved. Because if you don't know Christ as your Savior, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 14, your unnatural man understandeth not the things that are of God, for they're spiritually discerned, neither can he know them. I decided this morning, I decided this week, I'm going to get up here and I'm going to claim the word of God that all men need to be saved. I've been too critical, and we've been too critical of everything else, but yet the one thing we need to nail down ourselves, sometimes we forget. See, death was required. Look, go back to John. Death was required. We find that in the Gospel of John. Verily, verily, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say unto you, except a corn and wheat fall into the ground, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth this life shall lose it, and he that hateth this life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life, unto life eternal. Jesus had to die that we may live we have to die to ourself we have to die to our wants and our desires and come to him and saying there's nothing i bring to you except a repentant heart god save my wicked soul Ephesians 2, 8, 9 clearly says that you cannot be saved by your works. For you're saved through, you are saved through faith, not that of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Turn to John chapter 3. Let's go there quickly. We must throw ourselves to John 3. Let's proof text this for a moment. Most people, including some sitting here today and maybe some listening, will say the following. My good works are okay. I've done more good than bad. I'm not a murderer. I'm not Hitler. I'm not, you know, some mass murderer out there or anything like that. So what? If we are saved by our works, why did Jesus Christ even have to come at all? We're taking care of it ourselves. 
Nicodemus was a very religious man. He was a man that knew the scriptures. Look what it says in John chapter 3. Look at verse number 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher from God, for no man can do these miracles thou doest except God be with him. Listen, you can believe Jesus was a miracle worker. You can believe he was a healer and miss the whole point of why he came. Verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be man, Except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is the flesh, that is the spiritual birth, the water birth. And that which is born of the Spirit is the Spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye, what's the next word? Say it, please. Must be born again. You've got to die to yourself and your ways and trust by faith what Christ did for you. To be born from above is to die to self, to have a second birth. Paul writes it this way. I am what? Say it. Crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Philippians 1.8 says this, For yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus, Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things. I do count them but dung that I may win Christ. When this preacher, me, became a Christian, I had to lay aside everything that I was waiting on to, to get me to heaven and die to self and ask Jesus Christ to save me from my sins. Arrogancy, pride, religious, religiosity, and by the way, Baptists are just as guilty as everybody else in providing rules and regulations and to do a bunch of nonsense. I call myself a Christian. I just happen to be a pastor of a Baptist church, but... I don't even defend some of what our own brethren even do. It's not about being a Baptist, a Methodist, or a Catholic. All of those folks can go to heaven. You just have to come to the point that you accept Christ by faith. John 14, 6 says this, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man come unto the Father but by what? You have to die to all other ways. Jesus said unto him, I am the way. See, the resurrection is important because the resurrection not only validates what Jesus did, it brings Christ into the presence of the Almighty, always making intercession for me and you. How many people go to church week after week, or maybe you've never even been to church? And you've never made this subject real. It's not even personal. It's just a day. In fact, there are people maybe listening now, or people in here, you're more worried about some dinner with a family member than you are your eternal destiny. You're worried more about... Where am I? You know, I've got to get this. I wish he would hurry up. I'm almost done just to help you out, all right? Not, but I don't say that, no. By the way, it's okay to laugh and enjoy the ride. Some of us get way too stressed out about stuff. 
know, somebody said to me the other day, oh, you're just giving high fives. You're, you're just, listen, I'm going to enjoy the ride. If you don't like to enjoy the ride, go find another preacher that's all stressed out about everything. You know? <laughs> I had to say that. Cut, cut through it right now, all right? Are you a Christian? Are you? Played around with the edges? Kind of said the prayer once or twice, came, got baptized. I, look, baptism doesn't save anybody. Now, the next point I'm going to give you is going to light it up. Because if you're a Christian, there should be evidence that you're a Christian. Don't tell me I said a prayer and blah, 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 and I've been through this county. I mean, I mean we're all sinners, right? We all mess up. We all sin. We're forgiven sinners, but it ought to be a changed life. 2 Corinthians 5.21, a man be in Christ, he is a what? New creature. I'm not perfect. But if you, ex if you look at my life or many of your, your lives, you can see there was a time when there was a change. There was a time when something started to blossom. We will identify, our identification will be obvious if we're saved. There's no secret service Christianity that we're undercover and then we go to heaven. Raymond Abu McHale, who was here last Sunday night, said it so well. You either, if you're going to claim Christ where he is, you're going to be persecuted. Like it, leave it, or lump it, that's the way it is. His church has been firebombed. They've had to move out. They have been persecuted. What I want to know, everybody look here. We don't have to deal with any of that. I wonder how many would be here today if that was the case in your life. I feel guilty of that too. See, he says in John 12, 26, if any man serve me, right? We're one of his. Let him what? You serve, what are you going to do? You're going to follow. You're not going to be way over there. Yes, there's times we drift. I have counseled many of you, and I know about drifting. And praise God, you come back to him. But you're not going to let him get away. Eventually, you'll catch up. And where I am, are you with me? There shall my, what, servant be. You're going to be with him. When Christ is doing a work, you're going to be in the middle of it. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. One of the things that I believe hurts Christianity is people that got their fire insurance at some prayer meeting or some, and I'm not against a, an evangelistic meeting where you get saved, but what happens is you said I've settled it, and now I'm just going to go on, and I've got that taken. That's like the, the, one of the things on your bucket list that we're going to do before we die. No doubt. Your identity will be obvious. A servant will follow Christ and be with him. A personal understanding of the resurrection and accepting who Christ is will bring a change in you and, will, and you will be with him and will be identified with him. A change. Change. You understand that everybody is a sinner? We fall short. We miss the mark. Understand that the payment for our sins is death and hell and separation from God forever. That's the payment. That's what we've earned for who we are. And when you get victory over that, look here. Why would you not want to be identified with him? You can be kind and loving. My son has a church in the middle of San Francisco. They had the most unbelievable gospel presentation. My wife and I are watching. There, they will be fired. They have to be very careful, but they don't deny the truth and the reality of who Jesus Christ is. And people are getting saved. 
you may say, well, I don't think they're bold enough in how they say things. Well, you go live there for a few minutes and you see, let their, do their job, all right? But how many of us won't even pray? We won't even pray for our meal in public because we're afraid the waitress might understand we're doing something. You understand in Galatians, the Bible said God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to his flesh shall the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall the spirit reap eternal life. Don't mock my God. You know, you're mocking God by not accepting. Occasionally. It happens more than occasion. Somebody will give my wife and I a gift. Maybe $20 in a card or something or a meal. And sometimes we say, I don't really, I feel like we shouldn't, we give it back. And one person said to me, they didn't say it this way, but let me, let me translate it. Just, you're mocking me by giving that back. Look here. You're mocking God by not taking his gift. You're saying, I don't need it. I know more. Now, here's the point. I'm not yelling and screaming. That's not the type of preacher I am. Some of you think I'm a little loud, but trust me, I, I'll bring some guys in here. They'll peel the paint off the walls, all right? I believe the Holy Spirit works in people's lives. Stop mocking God. Secondly, if you're a Christian, you know who you are. You're saved. There's been an evidence in your past, but right now it's, it's kind of, you're running on empty. Get right with God today. One of the greatest, sweetest verses in all the Bible, and we'll wrap this up here in just a minute, seriously. I said this earlier, but God commended his love toward us. This is what the resurrection's about. And while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. And when the times of refreshing come, shall come from the presence of the Lord. Whosoever shall call, cry, beg, plead unto the name of the Lord shall be saved. I want to say something. When I got saved, it wasn't because a preacher banged on a pulpit and said I didn't have the right haircut, the right clothes, the right kind of music. If I'd have heard that, I'd have walked out. By the way, that's a lesson for all of us. Please don't ever do that. I got saved because I had heard a message several weeks earlier. And I met people that had a changed life. And I got convicted on my couch. And that's where I called upon the name of the Lord. We don't have these cookie cutter templates. This is how we get saved. Look on the screen. Is what we celebrate today personal or is it just a duty? Let's pray. Dear Father, I've said all I'm going to say.